It's been another totally normal, completely chill week in the United States Congress. Hunter Biden has agreed to testify publicly. They finally got it. Yeah. And they don't want it. We need to sit down and ask specific substantive questions without going five minutes back and forth with with Jamie Raskins and Dan Goldman and and uh, little Moskowitz jumping up and down. The Senate Judiciary Committee just voted to authorize subpoenas. I don't buy anything you just said. <laughs> Let's just be real blunt and direct. This is a. Uh garbage. Congratulations on destroying the United States Senate Judiciary Committee. George Santos was absurd before any of this happened. This place is littered in political theater and the American people are the ones paying the price. This is bullying. Congressman George Santos has been expelled. Congressman, what do you say to your constituents? Excuse me. You guys got to get out of my way. That was just one week. Why in the world would anyone want to leave that work environment? Well, for whatever reason, and I know this will come as a shock to all of you, it turns out lots of lawmakers have kind of had enough. They're leaving in record numbers. 13 senators and representatives announced they wouldn't seek re-election in November alone, which is the highest number in more than a decade. And while they're leaving for a variety of reasons, including my next guest, many of them have pointed to the recent dysfunction in Congress for their planned departures. The growing list of lawmakers heading for the door made me think, Now's the time to start a new recurring segment on the show. We're calling it the exit interview. The hope is that those departing lawmakers will be a bit more candid about what's really going on there than now that they're on their way out. And first up is Democratic Congressman Dan Kildee of Michigan. He announced he will retire after wrapping up his sixth term in office. So congratulations. I'm sure your family is thrilled Very that they happy. will be spending more time with you. Absolutely. But I wanted to start by reading um, from your announcement. You said... Quote, there are times in all of our lives that make you reassess your own future and path. For me, being diagnosed with cancer earlier this year was one of those moments. Thankfully, I had successful surgery and I'm cancer free. We're all grateful to hear that. But talk to me a little bit about how that diagnosis changed your perspective. Well, in this job, we often have very little time to sit quietly and reflect about mm -hmm. our lives and mm -hmm. about what we're doing with our time. After my surgery, not only was I sitting quietly at home, I had no voice for a while, and it gave me a chance to reflect, and it became clear to me that there's another chapter for me to pursue um, after Congress where I'm a full-time Michigander at home, surrounded by the people that I love and who, you know, who I want to spend the, the remaining years of my life with. Full-time Michigander sounds pretty good, it not, does. not even being from Michigan. <laughs> now, I referenced this a little bit in my opening. A lot of your colleagues have blamed um, dysfunction as a reason to leave. Uh, you were pretty clear on your reasons, but did that play a role for you at all as you made your decision? Yeah, it's a part of the calculation because when we make the sacrifice to leave on a Monday and say, maybe I'll be back Thursday, mm -hmm. maybe not, we come here. Yeah. And when we're doing work that is satisfying, like we did in the last Congress, it's a lot easier to justify that trade-off. And it's a lot easier even for my family to say, yeah, this is, this is important and meaningful work. Now, I'm convinced it'll be that way again, mm -hmm. because I'm convinced Democrats will be in the majority next term. But for me, the personal decision really is, is, is the larger part of this. But mm -hmm. it's hard to erase the fact that what we've seen, the Congress that I've seen in the last few years, is not even close to what I saw when I was elected in 2012. It was a Republican majority then. But this is not a Republican Party. This is something else. This is not like the party of Boehner or Paul Ryan. This is has gone off the rails. It's quite different. And, and I was in the White House when you were elected. And I remember we had frustrations, as I'm sure you did, right. about Republican leadership. But what's changed the most over the last 12 years? I mean, when you leave, you'll have been in Congress for 12 years. What's changed the most over the past mo more than a decade? The biggest change is that the Republican Party then had different policy goals, different ideology, different philosophy of government but was committed to trying to govern, trying to be a part of governing solutions, often things I didn't agree with. Mm -hmm. But sometimes we did agree. And when we did, it was good. It was good for the people of my hometown of Flint, for example, mm -hmm. when Paul Ryan negotiated with me, along with the help of Speaker Pelosi, the Flint relief package. Yeah. I couldn't imagine getting that done now because right. this group, this Republican Party, if we can call it that, is committed to chaos. And the people who are in charge are the most fringy, most mm -hmm. extreme members, and they're calling the tune. That's the difference. John Boehner had a problem with his fringe members. Mm -hmm. Kevin McCarthy embraced them and put them in charge. They made them his kitchen cabinet, and look what happened to him. 
and Mike Johnson seems to be doing something similar so far. You referenced uh, the Flint water crisis. And of course, during any member's time, but certainly during yours, you dealt with a range of challenges. And you pushed to get federal funding to help uh, everyone in Flint. You were definitely critical of the state officials who were responsible for that crisis. You were very vocal about that. As you were spending your time reflecting, do you think that entire crisis has prompted the kind of change that needs to happen around the country for communities like Flint? Or is there more you think needs to happen? There's a lot more that needs to be done. But the, 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 one of the things that's gratifying to me is that I was able to get help for Flint, but that Flint didn't stand as an anomaly. Mm. It helped inform our decisions. What we were able to do in the uh, bipartisan infrastructure law, for example, is to get money to take out every lead pipe in the country. Mm -hmm. I talked to President Biden about this many times. So Flint is important. But it also turned out to be an important lesson that informed the decision making of Congress. And it's that prolific Congress that we just left behind the last two years of, of Democratic majority, we did a lot of things. One of them is to help prevent another Flint, Michigan from happening. Yeah, the lead pipes is such a huge deal. Now, I know you have a year to go um, before and you have more chapters, but what are you most looking forward to? What's the one thing you're most looking forward to when you leave Congress? I, I think it's, you know, being in one place for more than three or four days at a time and being able to be at home. And I, I'll, I'll do more work. I'm not retiring. Right. I'm retiring from Congress. Uh, I've never really retired. I've never changed jobs. I just get a different toolbox. So I plan to go back home and find a way to make a, a contribution, but to do so in a way that allows me to to be with my family, mm -hmm. uh, to spend time with my friends. The things that are the hardest thing for us to do as members of Congress, I'll be able to do just as a part of my regular day. Well, Congressman, thank you for your service. You've got another year left. Can't wait to see what your next chapter is. Thanks, and thank Jen. you for participating in our very first exit interview. We're coming right